Hi there, and thanks for coming to my talk, Docs for Everyone. My name is Megan Sullivan, and I'm a senior software engineer at Gatsby, where I've been focused mainly on our documentation. My latest big project was rewriting the official Gatsby tutorial to improve the overall learning experience. I'm also on Twitter, where I talk about tech, education, and my dog Clifford. A little bit about me. In my life before being a developer, I was a teacher and a curriculum writer. And one of the things I really loved about being an educator was working with learners who were new to a technology and helping them move from a place where they felt really confused or overwhelmed and get to somewhere where they felt confident in their abilities to create cool things. Similarly, now that I work on documentation, one of the things that I love about my job is being able to have that same impact of helping people grow their skills, but at a much larger scale than was possible through one-on-one -on -one interactions. But one of the hard things about scaling your documentation is that as the size of your audience grows, there's a wider and wider variety of people that you're trying to write for. So the list of bare bones API references that worked well for your team when it was just a few internal engineers isn't going to cut it when you have new users who are trying to figure out how to use your product for the first time. So this talk is going to be about trying to answer this question of how do you build one documentation site that works for all of your users? I'm mainly going to be looking at this through the lens of experience level. So how can you create a documentation site that works for newcomers to your product just as well as it works for your existing power users? And this is my list of top five tips for creating high quality documentation that works for as many users as possible. And I'll spend the rest of this talk walking through each of these recommendations. So the first tip is to expose the architecture of your documentation to your users. And that means helping them see the big picture of what kinds of information is included in your docs and where to find it. A big part of this comes down to the information architecture of how your docs are organized. So imagine you're a user showing up to your product's doc site for the first time. It might not be obvious to you where to find the information you're looking for, or even what kind of information is available to you. As a documentarian, it's your job to provide new users with a clear map and signposts that they can use to navigate the content of your docs. One example of an information architecture that you can use to organize your content is the Diataxis framework by Daniela Prochita, which is what the Gatsby doc structure is based on. So in the Diataxis framework, docs are split up into four different categories based on the reader's current goal. You've got tutorials, which hold the reader's hand through their first experience with your product. These are specifically tailored for newcomers who may not know anything about your product or how it works. Next, you've got how-to guides, which are more practical step-by-step -step guides that help readers accomplish a specific task, kind of like a recipe you would use for cooking. Then you have reference, which describes the technical details of how your product works, like an API spec or a user manual. And finally, there's explanation, which explores more big picture concepts and helps readers deepen their understanding of a topic. In the Gatsby docs, we call these ones conceptual guides. And one example is a guide that we have that compares different content management systems that you could choose for your Gatsby site. The thing I really like about the Diataxis documentation framework is that it prioritizes the user's goal. That way, it's easier for users to discover the resources that they need when they need them. So once you've decided how to structure your documentation, you still need to let your users know what structure you decided on. And this is where the idea of exposing the architecture comes in. This is a screenshot of the landing page for the Gatsby docs after we reorganized things last year to fit the Diataxis framework. So now on the landing page, we tell readers what different types of documentation they'll find on our site, and when each type is most useful. We also list the four types in the navigation menu at the top of the page and in the sidebar so that we can keep highlighting our doc structure for readers as they work their way through our site. Ultimately, it all comes back to helping readers find what they're looking for more easily. So now that you have the overall structure of your docs in place, it's time to zoom in and focus on the actual content within each doc, which brings us to tip number two, Set the stage. Setting the stage is all about helping your users understand what you're talking about before jumping into the weeds of explaining a new topic. When I was a curriculum writer, my team had three things that we always checked for in every lesson that we designed, context, relevance, and application. 
Context is about explaining what you're talking about so that all your readers start with the same baseline understanding. This is where you define key terms and concepts, link to any prerequisite background knowledge you expect readers to have, and explain how the main idea of this doc fits into the overall structure of your product ecosystem. Once your readers know what you're talking about, you can move on to relevance, which is why they should care about this topic. What problem does it help solve? Are there specific use cases when you might choose to use this feature over another one? Then, after you've convinced your readers that this topic is worth learning about, you can move on to the application piece, walking them through how to use that feature in their work. Most docs already do a good job of the application piece, but the context and relevance pieces are especially important because those are what help your readers develop their mental model of how all the pieces of your product fit together. To help you get a better sense of what each of those three pieces looks like in practice, let's look at an example. So this comes from part three of the new Gatsby tutorial, which is all about plugins. So first is the context. What are plugins? Plugins are NPM packages that let you add pre-built functionality to your Gatsby site. Next up, we've got relevance. Why do we care about plugins? Because plugins let you add new features to your site more quickly than if you were to write them yourself from scratch. Okay, cool, sounds great. Now for the application. How do we add a plugin to our site? First, we install it with NPM, then we configure it in our Gatsby config.js file. Finally, we use whatever unique plugin features that are relevant in our site. Obviously, your actual docs would have much more detail than this, but identifying these three pieces early on in your writing process helps you stay focused and make sure that your final doc will help all readers, regardless of how much previous experience they have with your product. So now let's move on to step three, let readers choose. This is about giving readers multiple ways to consume information on your doc site so that they can choose the option that works best for them. So for example, in the new Gatsby tutorial, in addition to the standard text explanations, we also include a variety of other ways that readers can engage with the main ideas. One way we do that is by including diagrams to help readers visualize processes like this one that shows how data flows through Gatsby's GraphQL data layer. We also use analogies to help map Gatsby-specific concepts that readers might not be familiar with onto everyday things that they've probably encountered in their own lives. So for example, this illustration explains the difference between the static image and Gatsby image components using the analogy of asking for directions to a specific street address, like 400 Main Street, versus asking for directions to a generic location, like the best coffee shop in town. Each part of the tutorial also includes an embedded YouTube video where a colleague and I walk through the content for that part in case readers would rather follow along with someone as they work through the material. And the reason that we use multiple forms of engagement to explain the same concept in multiple ways is to increase the chances that a reader will resonate with one of the explanations, which ultimately means that they'll leave with a better understanding of the overall topic. Another way you can provide readers choices is by making it easy for them to opt into or out of additional levels of detail. In the new Gatsby tutorial, we do this by making use of MDX's ability to use React components inside of Markdown files. So we have two different components that we use to clearly separate extra optional content from the main flow of the document. The first one is this blue announcement box, which sometimes includes syntax hints for React or JavaScript newcomers, who might not be familiar with a particular piece of syntax. Other times it has pro tips, which go into more detail about things that aren't required for readers to know, but that they might find interesting. The second component that we use is this purple collapsible box, which under the hood uses the details and summary HTML elements and lets you hide content behind an expandable dropdown. In the tutorial, we use this to hide background information that might be helpful for React or GraphQL newcomers but that isn't strictly necessary for people who just want to follow along with the main steps of the tutorial. This would also be a good component to use if you wanted to document common error messages that users might encounter. So you could have the error name in the summary tag, and then users could click to expand for more information on what the error is and how to fix it. For both of these components, the goal is to clearly indicate to users what content is required and what is supplementary and can be skipped. That way, readers can tailor their experience through the doc to match the level of detail that they're interested in. Tip number four is to check for understanding. 
So once your users have found the doc they're looking for, they've read the content, checking for understanding is something that you can use to make sure that your readers are leaving that doc, understanding the things that you were hoping that they'd learn. So in the new Gatsby tutorial, each part is bookended by a list of learning objectives at the beginning, which outline what readers should be able to do by the time they've finished reading the doc, and lists questions and key takeaways at the end that readers can use to reflect on whether or not they achieved the expected learning objectives. These bulleted lists are a super low lift option, but you could also do something more interactive, like having a code pen that lets readers practice the skills that they learned. But regardless of the format, by providing opportunities for readers to self-assess how well they understood the material, you're giving them a chance to strengthen their memories of the key ideas covered in your doc, which will make it easier for them to remember in the future. The last tip I'm going to talk about today is getting user feedback. Once you've gotten all your docs in place and you're happy with how they're organized and the content that's in them, the only way you can know whether your doc's experience is actually good or not is by talking to real users. For the Gatsby docs, we have this feedback widget at the bottom of every page, which lets readers rate whether the current doc was great, fine, or bad. And it also has a space for them to write in a comment if they want to tell us a little bit more about their experience. And all of those feedback responses get stored in a database. And then we have a Gatsby site that pulls all that response data into a table so we can look at overall trends. We can see average ratings to figure out which docs people really like and which ones need to be improved. But ultimately, what's more interesting to me is reading through all of the comments that people leave. Some of the comments are really positive, which is great for morale, but more importantly, it helps us validate our assumptions about which things we thought would resonate with users. For example, when I was rewriting the Gatsby tutorial, one of the things I wanted to make sure to preserve was how the old tutorial was approachable for readers without any prior React or GraphQL experience. And by reading through the comments on the new tutorial, it's been reassuring to see that several people have called out the fact that the new content doesn't make assumptions about what people already know or use a ton of jargon. But not all of the reviews are positive, and that can be a good thing. By addressing the constructive comments and listening to user suggestions, you can make incremental improvements that gradually help you make your docs experience better for your future users. For example, we got one comment from a reader suggesting that we add a continue button to the bottom of each page of the tutorial, which was an easy fix to improve the reader experience. And we also had multiple readers write in that they were confused about a particular aspect of CSS modules. So I added in an additional syntax hint to explain what was going on under the hood. Now we don't get those kinds of comments anymore. Addressing these constructive comments is also a good way to show your users that you care about their experience and that you're actually listening to their feedback. So to recap what we've talked about today, it's hard to make one doc site that works for everyone. But some things that you can do to improve your docs experience are number one, to expose the architecture to help your users understand the big picture of how your docs are structured. Number two, set the stage by making sure each doc provides context, relevance, and application. Number three, let readers choose what works best for them by explaining the same idea in a variety of ways and make it clear when they can opt into or out of additional information. Number four, check for understanding by providing opportunities for self-assessment through questions that align to each doc's learning objectives. And number five, Get user feedback so that you can validate your assumptions and continue making incremental improvements. And that's all I've got. Thank you so much for your time today. I hope that you learned at least one new technique that you can use to improve your docs experience for your users. If you're interested in following me online, I'm on Twitter at Megan E. Sully, M-E-G-A-N-E-S-U-L-L-I. And I also blog at MeganEsully.com. All right. Thank you again, and I'll see you around.